Hello everybody and welcome to this video, part of the ongoing poetry analysis. And today we're going to analyse the Wilfred Owen poem, Exposure. Now it's widely agreed that Exposure is Wilfred Owen's most polished, most poetically impressive poem. He certainly spent a long time drafting and redrafting it. And as a result, there's so much you could say about this poem. So in this analysis, I'll try to try to look at some of the things which are often overlooked. My focus is going to be on the rhyme scheme, para-rhyme, the refrain, personification, sibilance, religious imagery, intertextual references, caesura, and more. So um, before I start, just to say that everything that I go through in this video can be picked up in my guide to poetry available at mrbruff.com, rather than you have to write everything down. So let's begin by talking about the poet, Wilfred Owen. Now, as always, we only want to look at the biographical details which relate to the poem that we're studying. There's a lot to do with Owen and Sassoon and how they met and worked together, but none of that is really um, essential for this poem. So we're going to skip over those details and look at just a few things which I think really help us to understand exposure. A little bit about Wilfred Owen. He was born in 1893. He joined the British Army in 1915 and died in battle on November the 4th, 1918, just a week before the war was declared over. He originally pursued a career in the church, but he gave up on that. And there's a, a mixture of ideas of why he gave up, but ultimately it seems that he just felt that the church didn't look after people like it was supposed to. There was some hypocrisy in the church and he left the church. He was an avid fan of the poet John Keats, 1795 to 1821. And this is important because I think some people um, sort of assume that uh, Owen began writing poetry in the war and wasn't he amazing, but that's not the case. He was already uh, writing a lot of poetry from childhood. And um, of course, it's his World War I poetry that we all look at now, but he was an avid poet and a huge fan of John Keats, and there are some references in this poem to John Keats. Let's just talk briefly about the context, the World War I poetry. Today, when we look at war poetry, I think we can think of it all as being the same. But in his time, Wilfred Owen was a revolutionary war poet. You see, before Owen, war poetry focused on patriotic verse which praised the bravery of the soldiers and glorified battle and you can think of Tennyson's charge of the light brigade I also have a video on my YouTube channel on that one uh, you know as being that kind of poem although there is some you know sort of uh, subtle criticism in that poem too but it's important to understand the sort of British attitudes to war in 1914 you see, the public hadn't experienced a war, a major war, for over a hundred years. And war was sort of, um, you know, became something of myth. It was thought of as something that brave people did. It was honourable. It, it was exciting. And Owen is very keen to dispel this myth, to expose, as you think about the title, the reality of war. You see, Owen didn't believe, like many war poets before him, of the, and this is his quote, glory, honour, might, majesty, dominion or power, end quote, of war. He believed that war was pointless, and this is the recurring theme throughout his poetry, that war is futile. And as we've already seen, Ted Hughes echoes the work of Owen in his own World War I poem, Bayonet Charge. So exposure focuses on Owen's experiences in trench warfare. In November 1917, he wrote to his mother, The marvel is that we did not all die of cold. As a matter of fact, only one of my party actually froze to death before he could go before he could be got back. But I am not able to tell how many have ended in hospital. So basically, the poem Exposure describes the way a group of soldiers in a trench suffer in the harsh weather conditions, dreaming of home, questioning why they are there, thinking about their reasons for being in the war, what they're doing and uh, whether it's worthwhile. Very interesting war poem in the sense that it doesn't actually contain any sort of battle or, or war with, between soldiers. The war is um, between the, the soldiers and the weather conditions. There are other Owen poems such as Spring Offensive and Futility which explore this idea of nature as enemy and it's one of Owen's recurring themes. 
And Owen uses language, structure and form to basically help the reader empathise and understand what it was like to wait long days and long nights for action which never appears, only to be slowly killed by the harsh weather conditions. Now throughout we need to look for the poet's deliberate techniques used to make us feel like the soldiers felt themselves. Not only of course are the soldiers helpless but their suffering is pointless and futile. So with this in mind, the title Exposure, we can understand from the context, could actually refer to not just the exposure to the weather conditions, not just the sort of threat of being exposed to the enemy soldiers, but also the fact that the poem and, the, and the, all of the poem of Wilfred Owen um, actually refers to the exposure of the truth for the British public of the reality of war. Owen is saying, look, look war is not glorious, it's not brave and honourable and and sort of um, romantic, it's awful, and I'm going to expose the reality of the war to you. Now what I'm going to do to begin with is give you a line-by-line -line translation of the poem, but if you don't want that, if you think, no, I understand what the poem means, then click the screen now, and it will take you straight to the analysis. In terms of line-by-line -line translation, this is a very complex poem. There are one or two verses that really do cause some debate and controversy about what they mean and um, I have looked at over a dozen books to do with this poem to try and get a really good idea of just some of the uh, more sort of difficult ambiguous sections so I'll, I'll talk to you about the meaning of the poem but as I've said in other videos the meaning of the poem the sort of literal plot the storyline of the poem is not actually the most important thing we can disagree on what's going on it's the poet's use of language, structure and form that we really need to focus on. OK, so let's have a look at verse 1. Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nive us. Wearied we keep awake because the night is silent. Low, drooping flares confuse our memories of the salient. Worried by silence, sentries whisper, curious, nervous, but nothing happens. So what's being said here is, you know, our brains are aching in this freezing cold wind which is hitting us. We're tired, but we stay awake on watch. Flares flying through the sky confuse our memories of the position we're in. A salient is a position on the front line which um, juts out into enemy territory. Uh, we're worried by the lack of sound. We whisper, we're scared, but nothing happens. And then on to verse 2. Watching, we hear the mad gusts tugging on the wire, like twitching agonies of men among its brambles. Northward, incessantly, the flickering gunnery rumbles, far off, like a dull rumour of some other war. What are we doing here? So what's being explained here, they're watching, they're hearing the wind as it tugs on the, the wire, the barbed wire, like the twitching agonies of men. Um, and then to the north, they can hear guns far off, uh, a long way away, um, as if it's in a totally different war. And then there's this question, what are we doing here? The poignant misery of dawn begins to grow. We only know war lasts. Rain soaks and clouds sag stormy. Dawn massing in the east her melancholy army. Attacks once more in ranks on shivering ranks of grey, but nothing happens. So in other words, the depressing morning arrives and we know that war goes on and that rain gets us wet. Morning gets her weapons ready, attacking us again with freezing cold rain, but nothing happens. Sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence, less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow. With sidelong flowing flakes that flock, pause and renew, we watch them wandering up and down the wind's nonchalance but nothing happens. So there's some gunfire, some shooting, which breaks up the silence, but that gunfire, that shooting, is not as dangerous as the snow which is falling on us. We watch the snowflakes floating around, but nothing happens. Pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. We cringe in holes, back on forgotten dreams and stare, snow-dazed, deep into grassier ditches. So we drowse, sun-dozed, littered with blossoms trickling where the blackbird fusses. Is it that we are dying? 
So here's where it gets a little bit tricky. So basically, you know, the flakes of snow are falling on our faces and we're cringing in our trenches. And then we're staring at a daze at nothing and we slip out of consciousness, beginning to dream of sun, flowers and birds. Are we dying? Slowly, our ghosts drag home, glimpsing the sunk fires, closed with crusted dark red jewels. Crickets jingle there. For hours the innocent mice rejoice, the house is theirs, shutters and doors all closed, on us the doors are closed, we turn back to our dying. So he's talking here about going back home, back home to Britain, uh, seeing the fires at home which are fading away because there's no one there now to make the fire, hearing the sounds of the countryside, and the, the mice are enjoying the empty houses and everything's closed and shut up because all the soldiers are away at war and we go back to our dying. Since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn, nor ever suns smile true on child or field or fruit, for God's invincible spring our love is made afraid, therefore not loath, we die out here, we lie out here, therefore we're born, for love of God seems dying. Now this is the most ambiguous stanza, and the author Douglas Kerr um, helped me out with a couple of details. Really interesting. Essentially what's being said here is because we believe that war and going to war is the only way to ensure that loving domestic life will go on and that children will continue to be brought up happy, healthy and protected, we're doing this. We're, we're at battle. We used to think of the return of spring as inevitable but now, in our concern for our loved ones, we're no longer confident that springtime and happiness will be renewed. And that's why we're doing this job of being soldiers willingly. Perhaps that's what we were born for, because the love of God seems to be dying. And that's ambiguous. Does that, the, the final line, does it mean that God's love for us is dying? Um, or does it mean that, um, you know, the, the right thing to do is to die? And I'll talk a bit more about that line later. But thank you to Douglas Kerr for that, because that really was the, the trickiest stanza there. Tonight his frost will fasten on this mud and us, shriveling many hands, puckering foreheads crisp. The burying party, picks and shovels in the shaking grasp, pours over half-known faces. All their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. So really what's it saying? Well, tonight's going to be another night of freezing cold temperatures as the ice um, and the frost sticks to us and freezes us and those soldiers who are in charge of burying their comrades with their shovels in their hands will look over the faces of the dead, the frozen, but nothing happens. Now let's have a look at something to do with the structure of the poem. Owen wants readers to understand the intensity of waiting during battle and then the anticlimactic letdown that comes when nothing happens. You see, we often watch war films and think, you know, intense battles, oh, that's, that's really sort of high energy. But of course, a lot of war is spent waiting where nothing happens. In World War I, with a lot of trench warfare, there was a lot of time waiting. Soldiers felt that they, they were gone for years and years of just waiting around with nothing happening. And during all of that time, soldiers lived on adrenaline. So they were always you know, highly strung as if something was going to happen. But of course, that's what leads to combat stress reaction, to shell shock, this kind of non-stop high adrenaline. So it's not just that nothing happens, it's that the soldiers are on full alert, with heightened senses, ready to go at any second, knowing that something could happen at any moment. So to help the reader to empathise with this experience, Owen structures each stanza in the same way. We'll look at the first stanza, but they all follow this pattern. Each one begins with a blunt and powerful sentence. Here we have, our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that knive us. Very kind of emotive with merciless, with knive us, um, you know, and, and the ache there. And then there was a, uh, that opening sentence is followed by highly emotive vocabulary choices. Wearied, low drooping, confused, worried, curious, nervous. And this heightens the tension and basically builds up to this sort of climactic moment of, of energy. But crucially, after dramatically heightening the tension, each stanza ends with an anticlimactic 
basically a, a line when, where very little takes place and in many of the verses it is this final line, but nothing happens. So this is a three-part structure found in each stanza. It begins with this blunt and powerful sentence, then there's lots of highly emotive vocabulary choices, but an anticlimactic final line. And Owen wants his reader to empathise with how the soldiers felt. Everything is tense and seemingly building to a climax, only to end up being nothing. The eight-verse repetition, as well, reflects the emotional roller coaster the soldiers were going through on a daily basis. They were exhausted. You know, day after day after day after day, this is what would happen. They would be on edge, they would be tense, thinking that, you know, they were about to be thrust into battle, they were freezing, they were suffering, and nothing ever happened. Now, the rhyme scheme is quite interesting in this poem. So it's A, B, B, A, C, and you can see what that means. That the first line rhymes with the fourth, the second rhymes with the third, and the final line doesn't rhyme with any of the previous lines. And there are a few things you can say about the rhyme scheme. So the way in which the first four lines establish a rhyme pattern, only for that to be broken down in the final line, reflects the building momentum and anticipation of battle which is never realised. So essentially the rhyme scheme backs up the structure of each stanza that I've just talked about. And the rhyme scheme, as we know, stays this way throughout the entire poem. Now it's quite interesting to think about just how long this poem is, and that's why you know we're already 16 minutes in and quite early into our analysis, because there is so much that actually just takes place in this poem. And the rhyme scheme stays this way throughout the whole poem, with its repetitive nature reflecting the repetitive and futile situation that the soldiers are in. Just as the poem stays the same, so does the situation for the soldiers. They're stuck in this cold, waiting. The poet employs what is known as para-rhyme. And this is where, and this is quite a complex thing, but it's very clever, where two end-of-line words, they contain the same consonant, consonant sounds, but not the same vowels. So if we look at these four lines, nivus, serlent, silent, salient, and nervous. Now, what, what's going on here? We can see that nivus is a para-rhyme with nervous. The consonant sounds n and the s are the same, even though the vowel sounds, which we have as the i and the er, are different. And the use of para-rhyme basically gives the poem a permanent sense of being nervously on edge, sort of incomplete, not quite right. And the soldiers are ultimately denied the satisfaction that would come with full rhyme. They're, they're, the rhyme is forced to be incomplete, imperfect, and this perfection and closure of full rhyme is denied the poem, just as the sort of perfection and closure of the situation in, in the war is denied the soldiers. Now, if we look at the final lines of each verse, because of the strict rhyme scheme, which we have with the first four lines of each stanza having this ABBA rhyme scheme, the fifth line, because it actually doesn't fit that rhyme scheme, it stands out. That, so basically, it's quite interesting to look at, well, not only what does the poet do, but what don't they do? So when the, the line doesn't rhyme with anything, why is that? And the final lines are really important. So if we look at the final lines of the final four verses, we have, what are we doing here? Is it that we're dying? We turn back to our dying, for love of God is dying. And what's interesting here is how these stanza endings relate to each other. The second one, is it that we're dying, actually answers the question, what are we doing here? And then we have this um, third and final one, which is a response to this. So essentially the poet is asking, what are we doing here? Are we dying? We're focusing on dying, for love of God is dying. Now, as I said earlier, the final line is deliberately ambiguous. But knowing how Owen was, um, you know, sort of had abandoned religion, it's, it's interesting to think, well, is he actually saying something religious here? Is he saying something about God? Because we know that he had rejected the church. So we could read the line to suggest that people are losing their religious beliefs when exposed to the horrors of war. And many people did feel that the horrors of war challenged their belief in God, causing them to ultimately question how can there be a God in a world where there's so much evil and suffering. In another of Owen's poems, Greater Love, he writes, God seems not to care. So it's that, that sort of backs up the idea of war causing mankind to question the existence of God.
But there is another interpretation of this word dying. The, the, the dying could be a reference to Christ's death on the cross. You see, the Christian belief is that Jesus came to the world to die for our sins, to redeem us and forgive us. And Owen makes this likeness here between the soldiers and Christ, ultimately saying that they, soldiers are Christ-like characters. They sacrificially die to save others. And of course, this is the ideology behind war, that soldiers fight so that civilians can be free. I talked earlier about how um, Owen was a big fan of John Keats. Now, we saw in Bayonet Charge, there's a video on that on my channel, that Ted Hughes mirrored the opening of Bayonet Charge on the Owen poem Spring Offensive. And Owen does the same in Exposure. His opening line mirrors that of Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. Now, there are lots of similarities between the work of John Keats and the, this poem. Lots of assonance, lots of um, particular poetic techniques. The fact that both poems are eight verses in length. But the, the main thing I want to look at is the way that we have Ode to a, a Nightingale with its opening line, my heart aches and that clearly links to the opening line of exposure our brains ache now what do we know well we know that owen was a huge fan of keats but why does he have this intertextual linking is it just a fan showing his appreciation well not really see keats was a romantic poet he used imagery of nature to explore human emotion and we could say that Owen is highlighting the darker side of this, where the natural world of a frost-encrusted battlefield can tell us something about humankind and its inherent capacity for evil. In the Keats poem, his heart was aching with happiness as he listened to the singing of a bird. But for Owen and his fellow soldiers, it's their heads which ache. And Keats was able to become numb through sharing in the joy of the songbird, whereas Owen and the soldiers are numb through the bitter cold. So what is the tone of this literary illusion? Well, Douglas Kerr calls it a provocation, and he made a really good point, which is that the quarrel is not so much over the nature of nature. You know, Keats finds nature lovely, Owen finds it brutal. And that's just a very simplistic reference to make. But actually... What's being kind of pointed out here is about the nature of poetry and what a poem should be and what a poem should be about. You see, Keats was Owen's first model of what a poet should be and what he had learned from Keats was that poems should be beautiful, beauty is truth and so on. But in 1917, after his war experience and after reading Sassoon, Owen had changed his mind and saw that sometimes a poem has to deal with ugliness and horror. All a poet can do is warn, and that is why the true poet must be truthful. So it's not really a question of whether nature is cruel or not, but a question of what poetry is for. So we can see the allusion to the Keats poem is his, Owen's way of saying, look, what is poetry about? If, if you witness evil, you've got to express that evil in poetry. Very interesting. There's also some biblical imagery in the poem uh, when Owen describes how the distant sound of gunfire is like a dull rumour of some other war. He's deliberately referencing biblical writings concerning the end of the world. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, Jesus is talking about the end of the world and whether people will be able to predict when it's coming and say, oh no, these are the signs it's coming. And Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. So look at that. The poet says, Owen says, like a dull rumour of some other war, Jesus says you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. So it's a, definitely a religious link there to the Bible. And Owen is probably making the point that this situation they're in feels like the end of the world has arrived for the poor soldiers. There's a lot of personification in the poem. Remember, what Owen is trying to do is to highlight how weather is more dangerous than, at one point, he even calls them the less deadly bullets. So if you're trying to say that weather is dangerous, then personification is a great technique. And we see numerous examples of a personification where human attributes are given to the weather, which is, of course, uh, not human. So we have winds that knife us. You know, the wind can't really knife you, but uh, it does in the poem. The gusts are mad. Uh, dawn is massing. Uh, air is shuddering and the snowflakes are fingering the faces. So all of this personification is really important. If a poet does something once, it's not you know, necessarily 
and you know a sort of huge thing to analyze but if they're doing something time and time again we need to think about why is that and of course this overwhelming use of personification presents the idea that nature is more deadly than enemy soldiers and Owen takes it one step further when he uses military imagery to describe the rain he describes the rain says that it attacks once more in ranks and clearly there's very little difference between the, uh, the soldiers, uh, enemy soldiers and the weather to Owen and his comrades both are slowly but surely killing them. There's some sibilance in the poem and hopefully you spotted it as I read it. Uh, sibilance, the repetition of soft sh and f sounds and you know it creates this sort of hissing sound. So we've got sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence and in the same verse pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. Now sibilance is one of those things that there are sort of a different levels of analysis and none of them are wrong and you can come up with your own and I would love you in the comment section to put a, an analysis of what does the sibilance achieve here. Now this verse, this stanza is describing when they hear the gunshots so you could say that the s -s -s -f 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 is a little bit like the sound of uh, bullets passing overhead or you could say that these are the sounds shivering soldiers would make. Um, we know with sibilance that it's a very sinister sound it reminds us of the hissing of a snake and uh, it really just get, creates this kind of negative atmosphere that reminds the reader of the constant threat of the environment the soldiers are in. And there's also caesura as well now caesura is where we have um, we stop mid-line in a, in a poem uh, due to the use of punctuation beyond a comma, really. So we can see there is a lot of caesura with um, a lot of sort of punctuation that makes us stop in uh, this verse here. And this is the first time in the poem where punctuation beyond the comma is used mid-line. Now, why is that? Well, if we think about what this stanza is about, it's basically saying that the soldiers are thinking back to home. And I think the punctuation usage creates a division on each line, reflecting the division caused by war between those at home and the present setting for the soldiers in a freezing cold trench. Now finally I want to look at the ending. The ending of the poem is really important. We know that it ends with the line, but nothing happens. If we're saying that the poem has established that the soldiers see themselves as a necessary sacrifice to save the happy lives of the public, and that's what they're doing there, then the ending of the poem is very depressing and bleak because it goes to this line, but nothing happens. And structurally, the poem ends as it began with the refrain, but nothing happens. And this repetition of the ending, this repetition of going back when you get to the end of the poem, going back to the start, creates a cyclical structure. The poem ends up back where it started, highlighting again the futility of the war, the fact that nothing has been achieved. They're just slowly dying. Guys, I hope you found this video useful. If you stuck with it to 28 minutes, you've done brilliantly. Please do subscribe to the channel and uh, thank you for watching.